I have the privilege of introducing our next keynote speaker, Dr. Ellen Ratchi. She is the Janet S. Cockrell Sentinel Chair in Engineering in the Department of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering at the um, University of Texas at Austin, UT. She's also a senior research scientist at the UT Bureau of Economic Geology. She has expertise in several areas, including seismic site response analysis, seismic slope stability, liquefaction, field reconnaissance after earthquakes, and remote sensing. Ellen has been honored with several awards, including the 2022 Peck Lecture Award by the ASC Geo Institute, the 2018 William B. Joyner Lecture Award from the Seismological Society of America, and the 2010 Huber Research Award from the ASC. Now, she's not only a you know, technical person, but her last thing I wanted to mention about her technical accomplishments is she's a fellow of the ASC. She became a fellow of the ASC in 2016. But what amazes me the most, not that I'm not impressed with her technical qualifications, is that she's an intense, ardent supporter of Chelsea FC in the UK. How you do that today, I don't know, <laughs> for those who follow soccer. But she has season tickets to Austin FC, and a, a, a new team in MLS. So she really loves soccer. And next, no, this year, this summer, she's going to New Zealand to watch the US Women's National Team at the World Cup. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Ellen Raji to the podium. Thanks, Reginald. Now, I do need to note that I started following Chelsea in 2007 when I did uh, a sabbatical at Imperial College. So I've been around for a while through the ups and downs. Um, well, I want to thank you all for being here. I also want to thank Thammer for the, in, uh, for the invitation to come to talk today about my thoughts of the role of data simulation and cyber infrastructure and geotechnical engineering. Now, as my thoughts today are really being influenced and come from two specific perspectives. First of all, I run uh, a cyber infrastructure in the United States called DesignSafe. Uh, it is to support natural hazards engineering. Uh, it's funded for anyone to use by the US National Science Foundation. So I've worked with our Texas Advanced Computing Center on that, so that's a significant perspective that I'll bring to the table. The other is most of my examples will be in geotechnical earthquake engineering, because as you heard, that's my research expertise. So those are kind of the two things you'll see threaded through um, in my presentation. So if we first think about the research ecosystem that we're all working in, Data is fundamental. We heard it last night, we heard it this morning. Um, it were, almost every talk you probably heard here was data was fundamental. But what do you do with that data? Well, you're gonna run some sort of analysis and as our simulations get more sophisticated, we're going to use higher end computational resources. So here the Frontera is the current uh, supercomputer that's running at our, our Texas Advanced Computing Center. And of course, why do you need those resources? because of the analysis you're gonna do, the tools, the software. We just saw some great, amazing new software coming out of rock science. But these three components, often it's the missing middle that links them together that we're, miss that we're missing. Um, and in fact, in the natural hazards world, that is really where DesignSafe is trying to, to bring things together. And I think this really fits in well with the whole theme of this conference in terms of integration of simulation data et cetera. So I'm gonna focus first on data and how critical it is, and I wanna show you an example from my experience on showing you just how, um, how things have evolved over the last 25 years. And I'll start off talking about the Kojeli earthquake in 1999. This was an, the first earthquake that I ever went to and did earthquake reconnaissance. Um, the, the earthquake happened east of Istanbul, uh, quite, a bit, quite a bit of distance away. Um, and if you know anything about that event, liquefaction was one of the major impacts of that event. Uh, this actually shows a USGS shake map of the area, as well as um, 
results from their liquefaction evaluation tool, which wasn't actually there in 1999, but they go back and, and do that analysis for, for old earthquakes. So that city of Adapazari had significant liquefaction. And so we can look at how data were collected and how, what subsequent research was enabled by that field data. So here's a picture of me. I think I look like I'm in high school. Um, but I was there, saw all those foundation failures due to liquefaction. I had my traditional tools. I had my clipboard. If you look really closely, I have a GPS uh, hanging off my belt loop. And we would manually be taking observations, waypoints, and put them together. So in 99, we were trying to geolocate our observations, which was a big step forward. We walked for kilometers on a couple of different street lines. And as you can see here, uh, we, we mapped the structural damage index and the ge geotechnical uh, failure index for every building on you know, five kilometer swath, trying to understand the relationship uh, between those two. And then researchers went back and did subsurface investigation to understand that. And because of the data that we collected, we were able to spur uh, several research, lines of research focused on, for instance, the liquefaction of fine grain soils or the and the response of structures on liquefiable ground. But I wanted to kind of more quantify the impact of this event and these data on our field. So I did a little exercise. I went to Google Scholar, and I did a search on liquefaction and Adapazari for the 10 years time frame after the event. And I came up with a good number. 525 papers had been published on, you know, on, that to on those topics together. Pretty sizable. So now let's, let's fast forward uh, 12 years or so to the Christchurch New Zealand earthquake, a smaller event, really bullseyed right on top of Christchurch. And as you can see, again, liquefaction was a big player in the damage in that event. So how did we go out and collect data? In some ways, it was similar. You could see people out with tape measures, marking cracks, trying to look at lateral spreading. We did start to use new, uh, new uh, analysis techniques and new instrumentation. So there were LIDAR surveys. Uh, what's shown here is uh, our estimates of lateral displacement from pre and post event optical satellite imagery. Okay, so we're able to get a good feel of what type of movements were, were happening due to the liquefaction. We the folks went out and mapped the liquefaction severity across the entire city. But importantly, you see all those dots on that map. Those were CPT locations. In fact, tens of thousands of CPT were poked into Christchurch. And all those data were publicly available through the New Zealand Geotechnical Database. Not just to New Zealanders, anyone around the world. Because of this combination of massive amounts of data, there were advances again. In this case, under, better understanding how we can do regional scale liquefaction assessments, uh, little insights into lateral spreading. But now let's go back to how many papers were written about Christchurch and liquefaction. So I went back to Google Scholar, did the same search with Christchurch and liquefaction. So we had 525 uh, for Turkey in the 10 year time period. Same, so now we're gonna fast forward 10 years after this. What do you, I want everyone to guess in your mind, put a number in your head, 6,260. Now, there could be many reasons. There's more researchers working, like a faction's become a bit more popular, or maybe we're publishing more. But that's more than 10 times. And my argument is it's the data availability that was able to strive and push our field forward with that data. So, Sharing is caring. We learned this all in kindergarten, right? These cute little dogs are telling us that. Uh, I am going to modify that term and say sh sharing data is caring, because that's how we really advance uh, our field. But what does it mean to share data? I could share this box folder with you from my computer. You might not be able to navigate it, negotiate it, find anything of use, or it might take you weeks and weeks. 
Really, to share data effectively, we need to organize. And we often use the word curation, which is a scary word. I don't know, when I hear the word curation, I think of museum curators walking around with paintings and whatnot. But this is data curation. It's simple, though. It's relatively simple. It just means to organize. And this is where we've put a lot of effort in DesignSafe to provide resources for people to publish and share data, uh, research data, field data, to push our field forward. So let me move on and talk a little bit about Design Safe and how we're promoting these things. So first of all, the website's up there. It's free for anyone to join. So register if you want, or if you just want to poke around the data repository, you don't even need to, to log in. But you can see in our workspace, we're very focused on data. We have the Data Depot data repository. We also have the reconnaissance portal. Um, because we're natural hazards focused, having field data from different natural hazard events are, are important. So each of those map pins have some sort of report or data set associated with it. Um, hurricanes, earthquakes, whatnot, um, and you can find those data. But that's not the only thing we want to do. Remember we said data, resources, tools, and that's what our tools and apps section does. We provide access to simulation tools, data analytics tools, uh, Jupyter Hub, Python, et cetera, so you can work on these data in the cloud. We also have some user guides, use cases. We've got webinars, uh, so I encourage you all to take a look. But let's talk about what this means to publish data. So in our Design Safe Data Depot, first of all, when you log in, you'll see this. You've got a private area, my data, my projects, but there's also a public area. That's where your published data sets reside. So here are listed some of the projects I'm involved with. As in a project, you, you add people to it. They all have access to it. Um, all the files that are in there, that's where you do your data curation. And once you're ready to curate, you can push the publish button and it moves into the publish section. Now what does it mean, or what does it even look like to publish data? I think it's becoming a bit more commonplace to see data published, um, but this is what it looks like in DesignSafe. So the first thing you realize, it kind of looks like a paper, right? There's a title, there's keywords, there's an abstract. Um, if you scroll on down, you start to see uh, a citation. This is actually something new. We've always had the citation capability, but we're making sure people know how to cite that you published your data and they're using it. So the way you would cite a paper, you cite the data set. Then you view the data. The data is well organized. Doesn't quite look like that shoe closet, right? But you can see if you have an experimental data set, which this is, you need to understand what the model looked like. You need to know where the sensors were and then you need to know what events, what shaking events, for instance, were applied. So we kind of visually help you uh, organize it uh, in a way that makes sense. A couple of other things, you know, of course, we try to make it as easy to download the data as possible. And we also track your data citation, data, uh, data downloads, uh, views, et cetera. So you can tell if people are looking at your data, downloading data, so that they would potentially reuse it. So how do I go from there, from a bunch of files, to something that looks like this? I do want to, I'm not going to go through, you know, this is not a training session on data curation, but I do want to talk a little bit about our philosophy for data curation. We want, we do provide structured yet flexible data models for any type of data for different types of research. I could make a very strict data model, you must tell me this, you must tell me that, but if you don't want to subscribe to that data model, it doesn't fit your data, you may not share it. I'd rather have your data organized the way you do have it, as you'd like it, as opposed to not having it at all. So we, th we have these five main types of project types, you know, for experimental data is different than simulation data, for instance. Field research is a little different, so we have kind of different tags. And then you know what? If nothing fits to what your data is, go to other, and you pretty much have free reign to organize it. But as I like to say, with this type of flexibility comes responsibility. You as a researcher have to do a little extra work and little thought, how, does it, how should I organize the data so that someone else could use it? 
And that's the key with data curation, is putting enough inf all the information needed so other people could use it. Because that's the key, the role of data, once you've used it, is that others could reuse it. And here are just two examples from our natural hazards community. Um, you know, obviously we often want to use data to validate numerical simulations. Um, and here, this was a great example of a young researcher who came up with a new uh, structural health monitoring algorithm and he needed data to evaluate it. And he used shaking table, a uh, shaking table experiment, that, uh, their data that had been published. We can also use field data to develop data-driven models for, say, natural hazard events. Here's some uh, hurricane damage data. But you don't really want to train it on just one hurricane or one earthquake. We can have tens of earthquakes and more data. So as we go to these data-driven AI machine learning models, pulling data from different sources is going to be key because you need a lot of data to train those models. So I do want to encourage all of us to make our data count. I like to say make your data count because our work is most useful if it's reproducible, which means someone else could do what I did uh, or my students did, and your data is reusable. So hopefully I've encouraged you that you should formally publish data sets and re data repositories. DesignSafe is only one. You may have heard of Zenodu, Dataverse. I mean, even GitHub, uh, you can publish your scripts. Um, I loved seeing the visualizations um, that we saw earlier in this session. So, you know, publish a visualization. That can really help people get at your data, uh, et cetera. But when you publish a data set, it doesn't mean it should just reside on the website. It really needs a digital object identifier, a DOI. And if you notice that citation I showed you earlier, there was a DOI. And then finally, how do you cite data? I see so many bad citations. People say, oh, my data's in Design Safe. That's all they say in the paper. But where? What data set are you talking about? And it's, it's really simple. It's sim it, all you need to do is just like a paper citation. You want to put it in your reference list and cite it in the text in the same way. So here's an example pulled from a paper we published where if you're reading it, it looks like, oh, Siley 2018, that's what it is. But then in the reference list, there it is with the DOI. That DOI push the link and you get to it and um, you can get right to the data set. All right, so we've talked a bit about the data. Let's talk a little bit about the other components, the resources and the tools. So at least within DesignSafe, we're trying to serve a broader natural hazards domain. Um, so we have simulation codes that are already enabled on our HPC high performance computing systems at TAC, uh, Stampede 2 and Frontera. We're trying to lower the bar to get people to use a higher end computational simulation. So you can access this through our web portal. You can embed it in a script in, and, and call it from our API. Or you can log on to the system and run it at the command line. So, but we can get you in and hopefully move you up to be a power user. And we provide easy access to uh, allocations on our, our computing systems. But it doesn't end there. We want to also enable uh, our data analysis and visualization. So lots of different types of programs available, all cloud-based. So it's kind of neat to see rock science moving a bit into the cloud as well. Um, so I'm just going to focus a little bit on Jupyter. I'm curious how many people have used Jupyter? All right, I got some hands. So Python, yes, I'm sure there's Python users. So Jupyter, Jupyter notebooks, I think, are really changing the way we're doing our research. Um, we have a Jupyter Hub in DesignSafe, and, and it supports Jupyter notebooks. Now, Jupyter notebooks, what is it? It's, it's like the electric, electronic notebook we had been promised forever. Um, and most of the time, we write them in R. You can write your script. You can have your visualizations there all in one place. Um, our Jupyter Hub has access to all your data depot files, so it allows you to stay in the cloud. You run your simulations, the outputs run, are in the data depot, you want to then do some visualization or post-processing, all in the cloud. Um, and we also have access to the HPC system as well. But there's a plethora of ways that people have used Jupyter. Um, and here's an example of an interactive data viewer. Um, 
scripts for data processing, AI machine learning. I'll show you an example from my research group. But the power here is you can publish the Jupyter Notebook for, so that others can use it as well. And I truly believe that accelerates the data reuse when you can view the data before you decide whether you're going to download it or maybe a numerical algorithm. Um, it's much, you, you know, you could put the equations in the paper and someone could re, you know, write, script it up, but if you provide it in, uh, in a Jupyter Notebook, it really makes it easier for others to use. And as we go into more sophisticated AI and machine learning techniques and algorithms, there's no equation to be written in your paper. You're going to have to electronically share uh, the algorithm if you want someone else to use it. Um, I did want to mention a, a couple of other places where we're integrating with external, more structured data sets. So um, if you're familiar with the NGL project, Next Generation Liquefaction Project, that's being run by Steve Kramer and John Stewart, uh, this is a community data set of liquefaction case histories. They have their own website. They have a very strict data model, because now you're talking about one type of data. We can put it all together. Um, through the web portal, you can upload your own data to add to NGL. You can download one file at a time. Not very uh, efficient. So the NGL data is housed in a relational database, SQL database. But it's replicated daily to design safe. And we have Jupyter Notebooks that allow you to access the NGL database in design safe. So then Again, your data analysis, your data stay in the cloud. So here's just an example for the Jupyter Notebooks that are available, CPT viewer, that's nice. So you can look at CPT, you could plot multiple CPT on top of each other. Um, if you're not really familiar with how to do SQL queries, there's some examples on how to do that. So you could pull data that you want to analyze, um, lots of different things like that. If you want to know other ways people are using DesignSafe, um, we've got a bunch of use cases on our website. Uh, anyone's been you know, wanting to learn more about the material point method for landslide runout. Um, uh, Krishna Kumar, my colleague, has a use case related to that. We've got some stuff on AI machine learning as well as a suite of others. But now I want to, I want to transition after this kind of background of design safe is how have I used it in my research? How have I used data simulation uh, and cyber infrastructure to advance uh, geotechnical earthquake engineering? And I'll focus on two applications. One is liquefaction induced lateral spreading, um, where we're trying to predict the occurrence of liquefaction uh, 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 and lateral spreading, as well as the displacements. And we've developed some machine learning models using some of the data from Christchurch. The other is the seismic performance of earth slopes, where we've developed some surrogate models for slope displacement that are based on finite element analyses. Uh, and we've looked at both traditional regression as well as AI models. So let's first talk about Christchurch. I already mentioned a little bit. We know that the Christchurch earthquake happened right under the city of Christchurch. Um, just six months earlier, a slightly larger earthquake happened, um, the Darfield earthquake west of Christchurch, both of which induced liquefaction and lateral spreading. So just to give you an idea of the observed uh, liquefaction, and here this is all focused kind of on the central business district and to the east of Christchurch. So you can see there's the Avon River uh, is threading through here. And in the, the Darfield event on the left, uh, the areas in red had massive liquefaction, lateral spreading. Yellow, kind of um, no lateral spreading, but significant ejecta. And the rest was relatively minor or moderate or no evidence of liquefaction. But the Christchurch event right underneath the city, much higher levels of ground shaking caused pervasive lateral spreading and liquefaction. Now remember, all of these data were available in the New Zealand Geotechnical Database. And so we were going to take advantage of that. We're also going to take advantage of some things that we developed. Um, I mentioned, I showed you, you know, this is kind of a zoomed in area on the left of those qualitative observations of liquefaction, where people walked the ground, said, oh yeah, lateral spreading, a lot of lateral spreading here, little lateral spreading here. 
Um, on the right is some of our results using optical image correlation, as I mentioned earlier, where we have a pre- and post-event satellite image, and we do correlation on patches of pixels to look at how far they've displaced. And so you can see along the river, we've got over one meter, one and a half meters of displacement. The displacement is, mo is largest near the river, and it gets smaller as we go away. Okay, so we're seeing consistency in where we're measuring displacements from the satellite imagery on the right with those field-walked qualitative observations on the left. Um, so that made, gave us some good confidence um, in the satellite assessments, which now really bring, give us almost a continuous vector field of displacement across the entire city of Christchurch. So for our predictive model, um, we had very specific goals, and uh, um, which first was to predict the occurrence of lateral spreading, and then if we did say it would spread, how much displacement. And so as I mentioned, we had our displacements, which are color-coded here, the black dots are all the CPT data that we had, and we wanted to predict lateral spreading based on things like ground shaking, geomorphic um, characteristics, topographic characteristics, say slope, elevation, um, subsurface data, groundwater table, CPT, tip uh, resistance, et cetera. So we had about 7,300 points where we had a displacement measurement as well as a CPT data point. Um, as I, the displacements came from optical image correlation, and the CPT data came from New Zealand uh, Geotechnical Database. So you can see we had about those 7,300 points or so were pretty evenly um, distributed between no and yes lateral spreading. That's shown under occurrence, about 4,000 and 3,000. Um, and the yes and no's are kind of color-coded on the map there. For the displacements, so these are places that did spread, uh, we had a, it was pretty evenly distributed between, say, the smaller displacements between 0.3 and 0.5 and 0.5 and 1 meter. But we only had 118 points um, that had over 1 meter. So we're a little unbalanced, which you're going to see impacted our prediction. So we wanted to explore different machine learning models. The key is to you, and we, we went with the random forest approach, which is a decision tree approach, um, but without thousands of data points, you really can't make, take advantage of these type of models. So that was something that was unique. Um, we tried various different features coming in. Uh, you know, the first, you know, I'll focus on three models. You know, model zero basically had distance to the river L, groundwater table depth, and slope. So things that you could predict without even having any subsurface data, maybe for one of those uh, USGS type assessments right after an earthquake. Uh, model three added on peak ground acceleration and elevation. And then model five added the CPT features. So I'll show you the results here and they're kind of color coded. So let me take you through this. So first of all, we got the three models going from left to right. In general, their accuracies were pretty good, 76 to 88%. And I'll, you know, I don't want to necessarily get into all the details, but we had our training, our evaluation, our testing data that was separate from our training data. Um, so if we look at the first model, the, true, the, the maps are color-coded. Green means that point was accurately assessed. Either it was accurately said yes or accurately said no. The red is false positives, and the yellow are false negatives. And you can see the confusion matrices on the bottom where you plot the observed categories on the vertical axis and the predicted on the X axis. And the color codings are there, too. So you can see, first of all, for model zero, we've got a lot of false negatives, a lot of yellow in that map. Okay? But when we add PGA and elevation, we do better. We, we lose a lot of those false negatives and we do a bit better with the false positives. Interestingly enough, when we brought in CPT data, we didn't get much better. Now, part of that is we were implicitly or kind of uh, in an ad hoc way putting in some of the subsurface characteristics by putting things like elevation necessarily in there. And then in the areas where elevation were an ex explanatory, um, the geology or the CPT may not have varied very much over those regions. So there's definitely more to, to work on here, um, but that was definitely a surprising result and um, something we're continuing to look at. 
And when we look at the lateral spread displacements, now trying to predict the displacements in the areas, again, our accuracies, if we just quantify them, are pretty good, 89%. Um, if you look at our confusion matrices, so again, green points are things that were accurately predicted. And here we were just trying to predict, are you in the low, medium, or high displacement level? So we're doing pretty good. And generally, if we were off, we were only off one category. Very few were we off. Uh, two categories. So it was promising results. Now, importantly, and I, this has become a constant in my group, is when, it, when we publish a paper, we publish a data set in Design Safe. So here is our data set, which includes all the data we use for our analysis, Jupyter notebooks that show you how we train the data set. So you can see these are all the you know, scikit-learn packages we brought in. Here's, you know, a script that did our k-fold cross-validation. So if you want to see how someone did the kind of grid search on that, it's there. You're not starting with a blank piece of paper when you're trying to script it up. We also have a Jupyter notebook to use the model. Because if you just want to use it, there's no, again, no equation for the decision tree. One-stop shop for you to see everything that went into that. So the other example, which seems very relevant since we've heard a lot about slopes the last day or so, is looking at the seismic performance of slopes. And this is where I began my career. This is where my PhD was on seismic slope performance, whether it was an earth slope or an earth dam. Typically, to look at the seismic performance, we predict some sort of sliding movement or ground deformation. Now, traditionally, we've done a sliding block approach where we look at a limit equilibrium analysis to find a yield acceleration, which represents the static horizontal force that results in a factor of safety of one. We then get rid of the limit equilibrium analysis, just take the yield acceleration, assume we have a block sliding on an inclined plane. We look at ground shaking, different acceleration time histories, and any time the acceleration exceeds KY, we believe sliding has occurred, and we accumulate that sliding displacement as a function of time, as shown here. Importantly, the characteristics of that ground motion significantly influence how much displacement you get. But of course, there's a lot of assumptions that go into this analysis. Localized movement on a well-defined slip surface, and that sliding and movements only occur when failure or the strength is exceeded. And Many of us, John Bray, myself, Jorge uh, Macedo at Georgia Tech, we've all developed what we didn't call them surrogate models, but they are surrogate models, where we predict displacement, say, as a function of KY, other characteristics of the slope, and different ground motion intensity measures. But of course, let's move into the, the real world here, right? We're, if we can do finite element analyses, why can't we develop a surrogate model based on finite element analyses? So our goal was to develop a surrogate model where our displacements were derived from finite element simulations. Now, the beauty of a finite ele element simulation is we're more faithfully representing what's happening in the field. There's no assumed slip surface. Deformations do not need to be localized. They can be distributed within the slope. We can model fully the nonlinear stress-strain behavior, and we're going to accumulate movement even if the strength is not exceeded. But if we're going to develop a surrogate model, we need to perform a lot of simulations, and that means computational resources. So again, we did this all within the Design Safe framework using the high-performance computing resources available. The other challenge when doing a finite element analysis is, you know, compared to a sliding block analysis, I could just say, KY, it's 0.1, it's 0.05, I just calculate displacements for different ground motions. For a slope, I need to actually define the full geometry, and, and again, we want to still have a surrogate model where KY is an input, so I'm going to still calculate those type of parameters. So we had our finite element model, we had different heights of the slope, uh, lower case D, how much soil went below the toe of the slope, uh, different slope angles, strengths, you know, C and phi combinations as well as phi equal to zero analyses. Knowing that the strengths don't only just influence the yield acceleration, but they also influence the depth of the sliding math. 
Um, and we varied the shear wave velocity, the stiffness uh, as well. We had 49 slope models. So here uh, you can see a plot of KY uh, as a function of the period of the slip surface. So you can see we were trying to look at a range of parameters that people would potentially be using. An important parameter that we, we realized was important was this idea of how deep the slip surface was. So we defined this parameter H ratio, which is the ratio of the thickness of the sliding mass to the height of the slope. So small values of H ratio are shallow sliding, and um, larger values are deep sliding. And it became important for our surrogate models. And we ran a lot of ground motions, okay? A thousand motions through peak ground accelerations from 0.01 to 3G. Um, but we also were interested in understanding if other ground motion parameters would better predict displacement, such as PGV, peak ground velocity, areas intensity, IA, uh, CAV, commutative absolute velocity. So all of those things. We wanted to see which best predicted the displacement. So I can look at one model, a thousand or so ground motion, so a thousand analyses. We can plot displacement on the vertical axis versus each of the different uh, ground motion parameters. So th these are all the same displacement data for one slope with a yield acceleration of po about 0.2 g. Um, plotted versus different intensity measures, PGA, PGV, Arius intensity, and CAV. So all of them, of course, ground shaking goes up, displacements go up. But you can see that the scatter in the models is quite different, even though, remember, it's the same displacement data. And in fact, peak ground velocity has the smallest sigma standard deviation by a mile, almost a factor of two. I'm telling you, I've, over the last 10 years, I've become a big believer in peak ground velocity over peak ground acceleration for damage, whether it's damage to buildings, damage to uh, slow, geotechnical systems. I think peak ground velocity really tells us a lot. In fact, when we looked at the, the standard deviation of these predictions, when we used a whole bunch of different intensity measures, so you can see on the x-axis here, just different combinations of uh, intensity measures. When we only use one intensity measure, which are those first uh, five there, PGV wins for sure at about 0.4 standard deviation. But look, even when I try to couple two intensity measures together, I can almost not do any better. Maybe areas intensity and mean period uh, TM do a bit better, but it's a lot more complicated when you have to deal with two ground motion parameters instead of one. So PGV, we decided, was the best intensity measure to predict slope displacement. And then, you know, we came up with a functional form. It's very simple. You saw it was pretty linear in log-log space between displacement and ground motion intensity. And then the key is uh, the in intercept and the slope, A0 and A1. That's where we needed those to be a function of the slope parameters. And so what's shown here, so for a shallow slip surface, so here this had an H ratio of about 0.22. You can see the displacement contours uh, with a maximum of about 10 8 to 10 centimeters. The slip surface in black, so there's a consistency where the displacements are, are localized. But look at how much deformation is happening below the slip surface. So it's not just failure on the slip surface that's causing these deformations. And, and for that reason, a0 and A1, those parameters, are a function not only of the yield acceleration, but the period of the slope, the flexibility of the system. When we went to deeper sliding masses, greater than 0.6 or so, you can see, again, consistency. Slip surface is deeper. Displacements go deeper. Um, and here, KY is all that mattered. The, t, the period of the slope, the shear wave velocity, uh, did not matter as much. Now, I would have loved to have not this kind of break at H ratio of 0.6. You're either one or the other. But from the, from the data we had, we couldn't do any better. But I will show you that it seemed like the AI model was able to find something in here that it was very hard to do on our own. Um, but let me just talk a little bit about model predictions. So here's displacement as a function of KY on the left for lower intensity shaking, PGV about 20 centimeters per second, higher on the right. The black line is for the deep sliding surface, where KY is really all that matters. And you can see there's a pretty strong relationship as KY gets bigger, displacements get smaller. 
What's interesting is the shallow. So those are three color, the three colored lines are for shallow, so H ratio less than 0.6, but for three different values of T slope. And you can see as the period of the slope gets bigger, we're getting more displacements. And the, the relationship with KY is quite weak. This is very different than what you would get from a sliding block analysis. I think this is more faithful to what truly is happening, but it is a bit of a paradigm shift of how much does the strength matter when we have these shallow slip surfaces? Um, and then just to, 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 to follow up on that thought of uh, developing a machine learning model, we looked at using an artificial neural network where H ratio was one of the input parameters. Um, and what you see here is displacement as a function of KY where H ratio varies from 1.6 to 0.2. And so 1.6 is deep. So deep sliding in green, very steep, strong relationship with KY. Um, and then 0.2 in black, a weak relationship. So, but it, now it's more continuously varying. So, uh, you know, again, a trend in the data that was harder to see and model uh, was able to be captured by the neural network. Again, our data set is published on DesignSafe, including the finite element models we used, the ground motions we used, the output from the simulations, the scripts that developed the models, and scripts to use the models. That's how we transitioned this to practice. So just a few final thoughts. Um, data, we all know data, tools, and computational resources have been at the core of geotechnical engineering. Again, we've seen it in the talks we saw last night, today. Great presentation by our rock science friends uh, before. But I really believe that research advancements can be facilitated by the formal publishing of everything that makes those things possible. So of the data, that could be lab data, case history data. Think about how many case histories have been analyzed and are sitting, and that data is sitting in somebody's filing cabinet or hidden somewhere on their computer, or God forbid it's on a three and a half inch floppy disk that no one knows even how to you know, access today. Um, but it's not just the data, it's the scripts nowadays, the tools, the workflows, and we can use these to validate computational simulations and develop uh, various types of models traditional statistical models, AI machine learning models, uh, using different types of data. But the key is the cyber infrastructure that helps link these pieces together. So we can see the computational workflows that enable surrogate modeling. We can talk about uncertainty quantification, model calibration, we heard a bit about that uh, this morning and last night. So all of these things I, can, I think can be enabled by these cyber infrastructure components. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Raji, for this excellent presentation. I think we can do better. Let's put our hands together one more time <laughs> for Dr. Raji. Thank you. This is a token of appreciation from Rock Science Thank to you. you for visiting and for giving us an excellent presentation. Thank you one more time. All right. But no, no, you oh, don't do I, uh, no, Oh, no. okay. Any questions? <laughs> All right. I'd love to answer. Any questions? questions? We have time for about three. Oh, over oh. here. I was worried I had talked too long and you weren't going to let me take any questions. No. <laughs> you can't get away so easily. <laughs> Uh, what an excellent presentation. This is Manoj Verman from Rock Science, based out of India. My question is about rockfall engineering. Okay. There have been instances, uh, recorded ones, including this part of the world, particularly in the US, in the past where the earthquakes have induced rockfalls within a, say, radius of 40 to 70 kilometers, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. There have been sudden increased activity in relation to even the Christchurch one, perhaps induced, yep. apart from the instability of the weathered rock, even in the intact portion, there were some rockfalls coming down jumping up in the air and bouncing again. So rockfall is increasingly become a concern and matter of interest. Uh, so uh, d d d did you include, uh, or d d does your data has uh, anything on, on, on rockfall-related rockfall stuff? That's f first question. Second is, 
Uh, in some part of the world, there are big hydropower projects creating big reservoirs, and then always been a concern about the reservoir-induced seismicity. So is there anything on that? Great, thank you for those questions. So I did not analyze any of the rock data, because I know, yeah, Christchurch, for sure, there were some rock faults, or you, exactly, you said bounce down. They had, I remember going back two years later, they still had those um, storage, the, the, the shipping containers blocking the road as, as rock fall protection. Um, and I know my colleague Joe Wartman worked a bit on that, and I'm not sure if he's published any of the data from, from that, but totally fair game, absolutely uh, true. Um, now you asked about induced seismicity, and now you asked about reservoir-induced seismicity. Where I come from, there's induced seismicity in Texas, but it's a little different. I think Western Canada has the same problem. You know, wastewater injection, any type of oil and gas activities. So uh, there, there, for my knowledge, and you can do a search on the data depot, we have hundreds of data sets, so I don't know everything that's in the, in the data depot. But from my research group, we actually are just finishing up some work on seismic fragility relationships for dams for induced earthquakes in Texas. So using uh, earthquakes recorded in Texas, um, which have different characteristics than a California event, um, but uh, above magnitude five, so we would have, we'll have the simulation data, the ground motion data, um, as well as the models that we developed there as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, there is one more. Oh. To my right, far right. Thank you, Dr. Rackley. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. Um, by the way, I'm Nick Dale from Texas. Ah, great. And uh, I'm a Longhorn, too. All so. right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one uh, question that I always feel um, when, whenever I look at ANN models, and spe specifically in relation with geotechnical engineering, not uh, related to seismic, uh, we always have challenges on data or the <laughs> quantity of data. Yeah. And is it possible to use ANN on synthetic data? So, I mean, in some ways, what I did with my simulations uh, for the, the, my surrogate model, that is, I mean, you can call it synthetic data. I mean, I created it, right? And if I wanted to do more models and I wanted my student to do more ground motions, I get more data. So, and I think you'll probably hear some of that tomorrow from Professor Hash Hash and her, his talk, because he's done similar, where you, when you have these simulation data sets, you can do as many simulations and as many parameter suites, sweeps so that you can properly characterize the input domain and then develop the ANN model. It's much easier to do it that way when you can control the parameter space, as opposed to if, you know, if you're dealing with experimental data, you know, you can pull data from different sources, but you may have a hole somewhere. And the ANN is, you know, you just don't know. You, as we all know, extrapolation in those models is fraught with, with problems. And so you have to be really careful when you use that type of, you know, experimental data that you don't go outside those realms. So, so th that's the place where I see that we can come up with synthetic data. Thank you. One last question. Anybody? Yep, over there. Well, there's one here. Oh. The, the microphone people are going to get a workout. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I'm Fahad from University of Quebec, Chicotomy. Uh, I have a very simple question to gather knowledge as I have opportunity to get you here. Uh, as we know, if there is an uh, earthquake, if we record the wave uh, using uh, accelerometer, triaxial accelerometer, the vertical component represents the P wave and radial and transverse component represents the S wave. And vertical component is lower than uh, generally the radial and transverse and it doesn't have much impact on strength reduction. In much cases, all cases, finite element analysis, we use only the uh, S wave, also you have shown, but there is option in limit equilibrium method we can use a component also with the vertical. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in Kobe earthquake, some places the vertical component was higher and also in Wen Chuan earthquake, I have uh, studied a paper, 
there was a landslide because the horizontal component was higher than the vertical. So just to gather knowledge, why we use always the S wave in finite element analysis? So in my opinion and in my experience, when we've looked at vertical time series, this is where you have to not think in a static world, right? So yeah, clearly if I put a vertical up and a horizontal, so I'm gonna decrease the normal stress, strength, and things are gonna move more. But when you look at a dynamic problem, the vertical is changing, and half the time it's decreasing your normal force, half the time it's increasing your normal force. So in my experience, it's always been a wash, you know, when I included the vertical or not. Now, I'm not saying that there couldn't be specific instances where, you know, not only the vertical is um, bigger than the horizontal, but the fact that maybe it's systematically only in one direction, maybe it's a big velocity pulse in the vertical direction due to directivity, that could play a role. But traditionally, we haven't used vertical just simply because it's always going you know, in both directions, and so sometimes it's increasing your stability, sometimes it's decreasing your stability. Thank you very much. Let's put our hands together one more time for Dr. Ellen Raji for an excellent lecture. Thank you.